we will continue with we will continue with the lecture on wood timber and wood products. Uh, we have looked until now at the uh, microstructure and little bit in the properties. Now, we will continue to look at the uh, engineering properties of wood and then we will look at some applications of wood and timber products. Here in the lead slide, I have uh, pictures of the Hadimba temple at Dungri near Manali. This is from the 16th century and the almost the entire structure is made out of wood probably about probably of Devadar. It is a very nice structure if you are near Manali you should try to go and see it. You can see very intricate carvings on the pillars and this pagoda type roof that the temple has. Now, let us let us start looking at the engineering properties of wood. With regard to the elastic behavior, wood is linear elastic only over a small strain range that is there is a small uh, displacement over which the behavior is linear elastic. The elastic modulus or the Young's modulus is highest in the longitudinal direction that is parallel to the grain that is where we saw that uh, the primary bonds are aligned and the elastic modulus is lowest in the tangential direction that is across the grains between the grains where you only have secondary bonds like van der Waals and hydrogen bonds. The values of the Young's modulus in the longitudinal direction generally range from 6 to 17 giga Pascal. For example, teak has the Young's modulus of about 9 giga Pascals in the green state that is as soon as it is cut and slightly higher about 10.6 when the moisture content is about 12 percent. We will use 12 percent as a reference when we talk about seasoned wood. With regard to the strength first looking at the tensile strength, the tensile strength of wood parallel to grain that is along the direction of the fibers is generally high it ranges from 70 to 150 mega Pascal. The failure strain that is when the uh, tensile strength is reached is generally very small in the direction parallel to the grain in the order of about 1 percent that is the failure strain is about 1 percent in tension when the load is applied parallel to the grain. The failure occurs within the secondary walls of the cells. Remember we had talked about the primary and the secondary walls of the cells. The fibrils break and this rupture occurs with the breaking of the primary bonds that is the covalent bonds that uh, comprise the polymers which make up the walls of the cells. The strength perpendicular to grain, the tensile strength perpendicular to the grain is smaller in the order of 2 to 9 mega Pascals and when stress or load is applied perpendicular to the grain, the failure occurs by separation of the microfibrils. Remember again that we had talked about fibrils or bundles of polymer chains. These chains start separating with the breaking of the secondary bonds that is the van der Waals and the hydrogen bonds. And here since these bonds separate easily the strains can be quite high and the cells are also distorted leading to higher strains. In bending where we have the modulus of rupture limiting the allowable load that we can put on. The modulus of rupture along the grain is in the range of 40 to 100 mega Pascals. So, this would be the bending strength. The failure generally starts with crushing in the compressive zone that is the top in case you are applying a vertical load from the top starts crushing and at the end failure occurs with the rupture of the bottom fibers that is the uh, cells that are aligned at the bottom start failing. Teak wood 
has a modulus of rupture about 80 mega Pascal in the green state and at a moisture content of 12 percent about 100 mega Pascal. So, you can see the values are quite high compared to uh, many other materials that we use in construction like concrete. In terms of compressive strength again parallel to the grain the strength is only half of that of the tensile strength in the range of about 25 to 60 mega Pascals. Teak has a parallel to grain compressive strength of about 40 mega Pascal in the green state and about 60 mega Pascal at a moisture content of 12 percent. This is because the cells start buckling the cell walls start buckling and there is a local collapse of the cell wall decreasing the compressive strength. So, that is what we say here in the longitudinal direction the failure occurs by kinking of the microfibrils and buckling of the cell walls. If you can imagine these fibers like a bunch of straws and if there is load in the direction of the straws the straw walls buckle. So, similarly we have in wood the cell walls buckling and there is kinking of the microfibrils kinking of the chains leading to local deformation and comp compressive failure. In the other direction when compressed perpendicular to the grain these are again hollow cells. So, the cells start collapsing at a stress of 3 to 10 mega Pascal. Again if you can imagine a bunch of straws if you crush the straws perpendicular to their longitudinal direction then the straw walls will collapse and flatten. So, that is what happens in the cell. After the collapse the deformation continues to increase because now the cells become flat until complete collapse and consequent increase in load after that because the cells have completely collapsed and they have flattened then the load can again increase, but we have crossed the useful deformation limit of the wood. Now, this can be explained by looking at the microstructure in, uh, in this picture. So, if you have here the cells and load is applied or stress is applied along the direction of the cell walls then we can have quite high load carrying capacity after that there is kinking of the cell walls the cell walls start to buckle and collapse leading to a failure like this. See here you have uh, the grains aligned in the direction of the load and you have kinking that is local distortion of the microfibrils and the chains and this propagates in a shear type failure. Now, if we were to apply load in the other direction you could be applying load in the tangential or radial directions again you have in both the cases the cell walls now collapse you can imagine that we are trying to push these cell walls together there is a lot of strain the load carrying capacity is low until the cells completely collapse. If it is in radial compression you have some rays which will take some of the compression load in the tangential direction you the rays do not really help much in the load carrying capacity in compression. In shear again the strength depends on whether the primary or the secondary bonds are broken and if the fi fibers are being broken or just separated. So, we say that the shear strength of wood depends significantly on whether primary or secondary bonds are broken during failure primary being the covalent bonds and the secondary bonds being the van der Waals or hydrogen bonds. Therefore, the direction of failure with respect to the grains determines the strength. Shear parallel to grain is common because lo lot of times we are loading along the direction of the grains and this involves breaking of the secondary bonds because we are shearing one cell wall against another and these cell walls are bonded primarily by van der Waals and hydrogen bonds. The corresponding strength is in the range of 5 to 15 mega Pascals in the case of teak it is about 9 mega Pascals in the green state and about 13 mega Pascals when the moisture content is about 
12 percent. Now, this is parallel to the grain when when we have shear failure perpendicular to the grain then we have to cut the cell walls and the shear strength is generally higher. Let us look at the variability which is always of concern when we talk about wood because it is a natural material we have discussed these issues in the first part of the lecture. We see that the coefficient of variation based on tests of green wood this is taken from the USDA document that is you will find the reference at the end. The modulus of rupture has a coefficient of variation about 16 percent, modulus of elasticity has 22 percent, work to maximum load which decides the crack resistance or the resistance to crack propagation is about 34 percent which is quite high impact bending 25 percent coefficient of variation compression between 18 to 30 percent shear strength about 14 percent coefficient of variation tensile strength 25 percent hardness toughness 20 to 35 percent specific gravity can vary by about 10 percent. So, you find that all properties of wood have high coefficient of variation and this should be taken into account when we decide the characteristic value that has to be used in the calculation in the design calculations. Again these are values based on tests of green wood and similar coefficient of variations also occur in seasoned wood. Wood is such that the mechanical proper properties generally decrease when heated and increase when cooled. This effect is reversible, but we have to keep in mind that as the temperature of wood decreases the values decrease when uh, we should keep in mind that as the temperature of wood increases the properties decrease in value that is the strength and the Young's modulus decrease as the temperature goes up. At very high temperatures there is a permanent deterioration of the wood that is the microstructure breaks down and you cannot have a reversible effect at high temperatures there is a permanent degradation or deterioration of the wood. Creep is also significant in wood creep is the increase in strain as the load is kept constant or the stress is sustained in a material. We find that creep is quite significant that is why you will find that in very old structures you will see that the rafters or the girders or the beams would have deflected a lot so much that you can visibly see the deflection in these structures. Creep is higher when the temperature is higher and there is more moisture in the air and therefore in the wood. So, protection of the wood against moisture is very important otherwise this moisture creeps into the wood and creep can increase and you will have more deformations with time. What about the thermal properties? In the case of thermal conductivity, structural softwood timber at 12 percent moisture content in uh, that is in the season state has uh, the thermal conductivity in the range of 0.1 to 1.5 watts per meter Kelvin and this is quite low compared to metals like which would have 216 for aluminum, 45 for steel it is comparable to what we have in concrete and glass 0.9 would be the value for concrete 1 for glass, but not as low as mineral wool which is a very good insulating material, but generally we see that wood is a good insulator it does not transfer heat very easily. The conductivity the thermal conductivity however increases with moisture content, temperature or specific gravity that means as the material becomes wetter or the temperature increases or it becomes denser that is specific gravity increases thermal conductivity also increases. 
since the thermal conductivity as well as the heat capacity of wood are low wood does not absorb or release heat quickly that is why when you touch wood it does not feel hot or cold to the touch as some other materials such as metals. So, when you touch wood it gives a comfortable feeling you do not feel as if it is cold to touch and this is because of the low thermal conductivity and the heat capacity of the wood. In terms of thermal expansion the thermal expansion parallel to the grain is in the range of 30 to 45 times 10 to the power of minus 6 per Kelvin. The thermal expansion coefficient across the grain that is perpendicular to the grain is proportional to the specific gravity as the material becomes denser it expands more and it ranges from 5 to 10 times the parallel to grain coefficient that is across the grain perpendicular to the grain the expansion is much more than along the direction of the grains. Wood can be attacked by fungi and insects wood that is always dry does not decay however, if wood is wet it can have decay. On the other hand when wood is constantly submerged in water that is it is always under water then the deterioration is quite slow since only a few bacteria or fungi can attack the wood under water. So, the worst case is when you have wetting and drying of the wood or the wood is always moist. So, in, in hot and wet climates deterioration is quite rapid rather than in cool and dry climates. So, this is something that we have to keep in mind and when you have a hot wet climate the wood has to be sealed we have to ensure that the uh, wood does not absorb water moisture from the air and therefore, deteriorate with time. The problem with the decay in wood is that the early stages you do not really see the damage occurring and when you detect decay already significant weight loss has occurred the there is damage which has occurred to the wood which is too late to repair and when the weight loss reaches about 5 to 10 percent the mechanical properties have already decreased by 20 to, to 80 percent in, in some cases. So, it is very important to keep wood dry and to have wood sealed in hot and wet climates. <coughs> now, other than decay due to fungi we can have wood attacked by insects termites are very very common that all of us are concerned about when you have wood furniture or wooden structures wood is consumed by termites some beetles and wood wasps. So, you can see the deterioration can be significant where the structural element completely breaks down, but sometimes you do not see what is occurring inside like on the surface they could be just like pin holes, but inside there is very significant deterioration. So, on the surface though you might have very little damage inside you can have significant damage. So, this is the problem again we have to ensure that the wood is protected against termite attack and it is sealed on the surface. In salt water generally wood is safe however, it can be attacked by marine borers such as shipworm and gribble, but generally if the timber, timber is under water nothing much happens to the wood. Fire is also of big important concern when we are talking about timber as a structural material. Timber is a combustible material that is it burns. However, in the case of a fire we find that timber can maintain its strength as temperature increases and the time under fire is large even better than steel because it does not deteriorate that much and it does not conduct heat as would steel. Now, what happens in a fire as the temperature 
at the surface increases beyond 100 degrees Celsius volatile gases are emitted that is there is there are gases coming from the wood and sometimes these could be disturbing to the people and can cause some extent of asphyxiation. In excess of 250 degrees Celsius that is as the temperature goes beyond 250 degrees Celsius if there is a flame outside the timber element the gases which are coming out can ignite and burn. However, if there is no flame there is only heat then the temperature has to rise beyond 500 degrees Celsius for the wood to catch fire by itself. Okay. So, if there is a flame there is an active fire then at 250 degrees Celsius the volatile gases catch fire, but if there is no flame and only the heat is increasing then the timber itself does not catch fire until about 500 degrees Celsius. The chemical bonds that make up the cell walls and the microstructure start degrading as the temperature increases beyond 175 degrees. So, in the range of 175 to 350 degrees Celsius the chemical bonds have broken and the microstructure has degraded. This degradation of the cellulose which makes up the cell walls results in the production of more volatile gases and the degree of polymerization decreases. So, there is a breaking apart of the bonds and the cell walls. Due to pyrolysis that is the action of the fire there is darkening of the timber and further emission of volatile gases. Then the reaction becomes exothermic that is the wood starts to burn and resultant is the charring or the formation of charcoal on the surface. The volatile gases which are coming out of the burning wood cool the charcoal and block incoming convective heat. So, it starts insulating the inside of the wood. So, the charcoal protects to some extent the inside of the wood and as long as sufficient wood is inside your structural element there is no collapse or breakage of the structural element. But as time goes on the charcoal start the char starts to crack the charcoal starts to crack and this material drops off and the inside material now starts to become charcoal and the burning progresses towards the interior of the element. So, that is shown in this diagram this process where you have heat coming out by the volatile gases that are coming there is radiation of heat outside and they could be heat coming in through convection also. This zone is what has burnt charcoal or a charring zone is formed and as the volatile ga gases of the timber now, now that is being heated comes out there is some convection convective cooling. This part is cooled and protects the interior of the timber. There is some conduction, but again the charcoal is a poor conductor. So, unless it cracks and falls off heat does not conduct inside. There is a zone which is degrading that is called, called the pyrolysis zone. This is the zone which is where the wood is degrading and going to catch fire and become charcoal. So, until this charcoal is in position then the interior is to some extent protected, but after some time it will crack and fall off and the pyrolysis will enter into the heart of the timber element. So, as we said the formation of the char or the charcoal protects the unburnt timber and failure occurs only when the un unburnt section cannot withstand the applied load. So, as long as you have a sizable part of the timber unburnt the structural element does not collapse. We also have to understand that timber is processed before it is used that is the tree has to be cut uh, into logs and the logs have to be cut into suitable pieces of uh, timber and this process is called conversion. Lot of wood is actually lost during conversion when we make uh, timber pieces about 30 to 50 percent of the wood is actually lost in this processing. 
this is one reason why processed wood is better because nothing not much is wasted. However, if we have to use uh, planks of wood or large pieces of wood lot of material is wasted in the conversion. After sawing the timber is graded depending on the type grain, grain direction knots sap wood worm holes and so on. In India grading is done according to the type of wood and the visible defects in the wood. In the United States and other countries timber for construction is stress graded that is just like you would have a grading of concrete wood is also stress graded depending on strength, stiffness and uniformity of the size of the pieces of wood. Non-destructive tests, non-destructive tests can also be used to verify the mechanical integrity that is how strong or how uniform the properties are of wood. Let us look at some applications of timber. We used to have and in some places we continue to have lot of roofs made out of timber where this is called a rafter type roof where we have uh, different elements. We have the end studs holding up the sides, then we have uh, these plates, we have the rafters here holding up the roofing material the collar beams, this is the ridge board and so on and then the, there are joints which have to be properly made like what is shown here in, uh, in this drawing where we have to ensure that the rafter is properly joined to the columns and to the top plates. So, this would be a typical structural system for a roof on which there could be tiles placed or shingles and so on. Now, there are and they have been lot of houses buildings made in this manner. This is what you see in the picture where you would have a roof like what was shown in the previous uh, diagram and in addition here even the walls are made out of timber. This is uh, these are logs cut into square sections and used to make the wall of this house. So, not only do we have older houses or rural houses made out of wood, you can also have modern homes with timber structural framework. These are pictures from um, Melbourne, Australia where you have homes which do not look as if they are made out of timber because the structural framework is hidden and then they could be cladding which could be something like brickwork or plaster stucco and so on. So, the above pictures you can see that these are homes made out of timber or in the uh, or the uh, uh, photos in uh, the photos in the upper half show you uh, homes made out of made with timber structured framework. I will do it again the these pictures show you homes where the structural framework is timber even though outside it does not look the same. There are some places where the timber is visible these are planks of timber at the bottom. You see the timber when one of these houses are demolished this is a house this is a picture taken of a house being demolished and you can see the rafters you can see the entire structural framework of the roof and here you can see the wall as it is being torn apart you can see the structural framework inside the wall also. Timber can be used for larger buildings as well these are uh, this is the framework of a commercial building this could be in the United States or um, uh, some other place where wood is common and you can have a building with three or four floors even made out of timber. They have been bridges that have been built on timber here you see one in the picture and these bridges can come up quickly can be assembled quite quickly and that is one of the regions, reasons why timber is used.
Timber is also used a lot in waterfront and ocean front applications because there is no problem of corrosion that you could have in the case of steel or concrete. Mm. So, you can have wharfs and jetties made out of uh, timber and even entire buildings could be made with uh, their structural framework of timber. Now, what you see here and you can see here as well, these are fender piles which are driven into the seabed or the uh, river bed and these protect the structures when ships are moored or boats are moored and uh, these fender piles now resist any horizontal loading that can come because of the boat or boats because of the boats. So, these are called fender piles and as long as the wood is well protected or very deep under water there is no decaying which occurs in these piles. We can have more applications on the waterfront. This is a walkway and decking stairs all made out of wood uh, on the sea front. We can also have poles of all sorts. These are poles for electrical and telephone lines made out of long trees, made out of tall trees and these poles have been quite common for a long time. A major application of timber is in scaffolding and form work for concrete. We have all sorts of applications in this case on the left top what you see are uh, planks of timber which are used for uh, form work for the slab and for the beams at the top and you can also have form work for the walls. This is plywood and then struts and uh, shoring for a concrete wall that is going to be cast. Then you can have even more basic construction again with wood. Here the wood is used for supports or shoring as well as for the form work of the slab and for the beams. So, here plywood would be used or planks of wood be used and at the bottom you will have poles of uh, timber that are supporting the form work of the slabs and the beams. You can also have boxes made out of timber for casting of the concrete columns. So, here you see that these are wooden boxes inside it concrete will be placed and then the uh, wooden form work obviously is removed and even the support structures are all made out of wood. We can have more complicated form work as well where there is an extensive design that has to be done of the form work that itself uh, becomes like a structure that has to be designed for loads and deformations. In both these uh, pictures you see form work for shell roofs this would be the shell roof that will be cast on top of this uh, form work. This is similar to scaffolding and this is the whole support system that we see. This is for another shell uh, being going to be cast with short crete and this is the form work for that. Now, concrete will be short on top and then this form work will be removed and you will have the concrete in the shape of this form work. I had mentioned that there are processed timber products or composites made out of wood. One such composite is called glue lamb for glued laminated timber. This is not very common in India, but countries like the United States use them a lot. Here the timber is manufactured by gluing together a large number of relatively short pieces of timber. So, short pieces of timber are cut and glued together and by gluing such pieces glue lamp timber can be obtained up to say 40 meters in length and over 2 meters deep and these can be curved or straight. So, you can get large elements 
which would be practically impossible to get from a single tree. The pieces are glued together such that the grain directions are generally parallel that is you have the grains or the fibers running along the direction of the longitudinal axis of the glue lamb element. This could be more expensive than sawn timber however, there are lot of advantages first the size you can have different sizes large sizes and depths that could be needed and will come ready from the factory. Architecturally also it looks nice it need not be painted you can uh, have the joints give an architectural effect. Seasoning has its advantage because a thick piece of wood will take a long time to be seasoned however, here seasoning is uh, seasoning is faster since only the individual pieces are seasoned before they are glued together. You can have varying cross sections and we can also have varying grades depending on what we want in a certain application. Couple of pictures of glue lamb applications here you see a three hinged deck arch bridge of highway 16 in the United States near Ma Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Here you have the arch spanning 47 meters and supports a 8 meter wide roadway on top this is the roadway on the deck and this is the three hinge arch you have one hinge here and the other two hinges at the support. So, you can have this is the glue lamb element. So, you can see the glue lamb element large spans and with the curvature coming ready to use. So, the assembly is fast and the construction does not take much time. You can have portico frames these are frames again made out of glue lamb yeah, this is a picture from the USDA document you see here this this is now all made out of glue lamp instead of individual pieces put together at the site this whole element comes ready to assemble or put in place. There are other composites that we are more familiar with in India plywood being one of them plywood is made out of panels and sheets plywood is uh, plywood is made of panels and sheets that are made from thin veneers of wood that is a thin layer of wood is taken and one is glued to the other like what is shown here and generally we find that the grains are in alternate perpendicular directions that is if in one layer the grains are along this direction the other veneer will have grains in the other direction. So, therefore, you have something like an isotropic behavior in the plane of the plywood you do not have all the grains in one direction, but you have grains in both direction and we saw that the properties in the direction of the grains are always better. So, when you put these alternative uh, sheets then you have almost similar properties in both these directions. Advantages of plywood it can be made in large sheets because it is just a question of gluing the veneers one on top of the other. It is split resistant because the fibers are not running all in the same direction. So, uh, it does not split that easily if a nail is driven through or if a screw is driven in through the plywood. And as we saw before because the veneers are placed uh, right angles to each other in terms of the fiber directions you can have same properties in both directions of the sheet. And if at all there are knots in the previous uh, part of this lecture we looked at the effect of knots if at all there is a knot it is limited to only one veneer or ply the knot does not run through. So, you do not have the possibility of a knot dropping out of a sheet of plywood that could possibly happen in the case of timber shrinkage and swelling are also minimized more because they can be coated the plywood can be coated and protected against uh, water entering. And again because of the directions 
being interchanged between one ply and the other you do not have a large amount of shrinkage or swelling in one direction. So, there are a lot of advantages in plywood. There are other composites like particle board where chips of wood are dried mixed with the resin and pressed together to form boards this is called particle board. Typically the particle board will have three layers the faces the outside layers consist of fine particles and the inner layer consists of coarse particles. Therefore, you get a good finish on the surface and interior you can have coarser material that can be used. Other composites are fiber board where instead of pieces the fibers are put together strands you can even have cement bonded particle board where pieces of wood are bonded together with cement and this gives a good appearance more stiffness and sometimes when you have cladding or partitions made out of cement bonded particle board it gives the feeling of masonry or it could give the feeling of concrete be having been used. We can also have composites which could have wood fibers with a matrix that is a thermoplastic. So, that would be the case of wood being used as a filler in a polymer matrix this brings down the cost and also gives rise to lighter elements. We will know more about these composites in the next lecture where we will have someone from industry coming and talking to us about the different wood based composites. So, here are some uh, references which are quite useful there lot of lot of material is available on the web that you can also look at. So, to summarize in, uh, in this lecture we have looked at timber wood and wood products and we have seen why timber is a useful material it has been used continues to be used as a structural material in different uh, areas depending on the availability of wood and timber and in other places it is more used for decorative uh, applications furniture is still being made of wood and we have more and more the usage of uh, wood products that are made out of pieces of wood put together like particle boards, chipboard and so on and this will continue to be there because it has a lot of advantages in terms of uh, structural behavior, aesthetics and the ease of uh, machining, cutting and putting it uh, together. Thank you.